Hi everybody. I was reading an article today that I wanted to talk about uh, that has to do with the origin of the study of Gnosticism in general. There's a lot of interesting scholarship right now happening uh, around whether the term Gnosticism itself is actually useful as a category. Um, many scholars on both sides of that issue have made a lot of interesting arguments. Uh, I come at it from a slightly different angle. I do think that Gnosticism is useful as a category, not necessarily in um, textual criticism or other scholarly purposes. You know, that's not really my thing, so I don't have a strong opinion on how they do things. <clears throat> but what I do think is that it's an important category uh, of for religious practitioners. And I'll tell you what I mean, but first, a little bit of background. The term Gnosticism itself was coined in the 17th century by an English theologian by the name of Henry Moore. Um, and he was kind of the first person to put together a lot of these uh, disparate traditions that came to be called Gnosticism. Um, he did it as a way of, uh, of reinforcing what became orthodoxy. Um, so in a sense he was kind of using the term Gnosticism almost as a, uh, as a stand-in for heresy, for the word heresy. And thus it has been for uh, many centuries now. That's kind of how it gets used by um, mainline Christian religious people. Uh, most of it is tied up in, uh, you know, dualism uh, especially. So when the or paganism even more broadly, uh, which is interesting in and of itself. There are a lot of Protestants who um, accuse Catholics of being Gnostic because of their quote-unquote pagan tendencies, which include, you know, idols and traditions and ceremonies and things like that that, that the Catholic Church does that our own uh, Joanite Church also shares. Uh, my own Joe and I church, <laughs> not necessarily yours. Um, but interestingly enough, the term Gnosticism being applied to a wide variety of heresies is actually what a lot of these scholars who argue against the term are, are talking about. This is, this is what they mean when they say that Gnosticism as a category isn't particularly useful um, because of all this uh, stuff that got kind of accreted around it. But in reality, if you don't think of Gnosticism as some monolithic thing, um, which almost nobody does anyway, uh, Gnosticism as a category, as a family of religious traditions, begins to make some sense. When you talk about religious traditions that, pl that place a primary focus on Gnosis, uh, religious traditions that have some kind of an emanations cosmology, posit some kind of intermediary, creator, figure, demiurge kind of thing, then there are a number of religious traditions um, that, that use those kind of hallmarks, if you will, of Gnosticism. The Sethians, or the group of traditions even called Sethianism, there's a, you get into how many angels can dance on the head of a pin, but there's a group of traditions that contain, um, I would consider, the Ophites, uh, what are called in some um, some cases the Barbelloites or the Barbello Gnostics, um, and other traditions that have Seth as a primary savior figure, I, I'll lump them all in together as Sethians. I think just for ease of, of use, um, and that's actually kind of my point. You know, going off on that tangent for a minute here is that every time scholars talk about whether or not Gnosticism as a use, is a useful category, though especially those who argue against it, they continue to use the word throughout their books and articles and theses and things like that. So when they say Gnosticism isn't a useful category, and let me tell you why all these Gnosticism traditions aren't really Gnosticism, and they keep using the word, <laughs> and I get maybe they don't have a better word, uh, but still. It's kind of like we all know what we mean when we say Gnosticism, with some, you know, uh, outside at the, at the fringes, you know, is, is Manichaeanism Gnosticism? Um, some people say yes, some people say no. And there are other traditions like that where that kind of fall into a maybe they do, maybe they don't category. I, I don't think it's particularly useful to 
force them to be in one category or another. But we all know what we mean when we say Gnosticism. We all know what we're talking about. So even if you don't like the term as a category for a, a literary corpus, which, fine, who cares, uh, <laughs> then, you know, it's still useful for those of us who want to practice a religious tradition that includes those things. Christianity itself was never a monolithic thing either until a, there was a very kind of brief period of its history where it was one thing, maybe a couple of hundred years. But, you know, it was never really the single perennial tradition that many modern-day Christians would have you believe. Um, you know, even before the Great Schism and before the Protestant Reformation and before all of the other times when the Catholic Church and the Orthodox Church split, or when the, the Christian tradition split, uh, which it has done many, many, many times, it wasn't a, f a unified thing at the beginning. Each individual church, each individual community, had its own set of teachers and books and theologies and all that stuff. And that was the entirety of the ecumenical councils for the first several hundred years of Christianity's existence was deciding on <laughs> which of these ideas the majority agreed upon and which they were going to let go. It got a little heated and uh, there were some uh, violent consequences from those decisions. But still, it's, it was just a numbers game the whole way through. I, I've been saying for the past several years when I talk about Gnosticism, it wasn't squashed by the early church. It just wasn't as popular as the other uh, forms of Christianity that were around at the time. That isn't to say that I'm sure that there was violence uh, against people who call themselves Gnostics. Well, didn't call themselves Gnostics. People who fall into the category of what we now call Gnosticism, I'm sure that there was some violence, and I'm sure that they did some violence against some of the other rival groups. I mean, people are people, and some people are just dicks, so it doesn't matter what <laughs> religious tradition you follow, uh, that's, that's always going to be true. Anyway, in closing, I just wanted to share some of my thoughts on that. I, you know, I do think that Gnosticism as a family of religious traditions is a useful way of talking about it. To say the word Gnosticism and to know that we mean the Sethians, the Valentinians, the Mandaeans, and other groups. Uh, even going through the Middle Ages when you talk about the Paulicians, the Bogomils, and the Cathars. You know, you can even make an argument that those are continuations of a Gnostic tradition, even though we certainly don't know how those ideas traveled from there to here. I'm working on a presentation right now about Gnostic magic because it's fascinating to me and there is a document that you can find uh, in fact there's lots and lots of documents you can get uh, get, your hold on, get your hands on but the one that I have uh, that's most interesting to me is this thing called the Macquarie Papyri the book is called A Coptic Handbook of Ritual Power it is probably a 7th century document and it contains very strongly Sethian elements uh, including uh, you know, talking about Seth as the redeemer figure um, the four lights of the Sethian cosmology uh, Barbello, uh, Yaldabaoth, you know, all these kinds of very Sethian ideas. Um, but in the seventh century, long, long, long after, there were probably no more practicing Sethians. And what's interesting is that these traditions carried on in the folk practices of, the, of especially uh, northern Africa and, and, uh, and kind of the... Um, the Near East and you know Southern Europe, like these these were still people who called upon the same prayed to the same figures that the Sethians would have long after they probably even knew where those names came from. They probably just knew that their fathers and mothers and grandfathers and grandmothers had done so, and all the way back to probably some Sethian in the first, second, third century. Anyway. That was a tangent. <laughs> Maybe that won't even make the blog. Maybe it will. Uh, but anyway, I uh, just um, wanted to share some thoughts on how I see the category of Gnosticism. What do you think? Do you think that Gnosticism is a useful category, whether in scholarly use or in religious practice use? Let me know in the comments. I'd love to hear from you.
Thanks and see you next time.